Good morning. Before turning to today's topic, I want to take a moment to address the horrific shooting of three young Palestinian men in Burlington over the weekend. First, I want to extend my sincere sympathy to the victims and their families. I know thousands of Vermonters join me in offering our condolences and support during this difficult time. This act of violence is both sad and baffling and has caused much harm and heartache in our communities. I reached out to the president of the Islamic Society of Vermont over the weekend to offer my and the state's support. I also want to thank Mayor Weinberger, the Burlington uh, Police Department, our federal partners, first responders, and medical professionals for their quick response to this despicable shooting. While there is more work to do to seek justice for these young men, we must also work to curtail these violent acts in the future. I urge Vermonters to unite to help the community heal and not let this incident incite more hate or divisiveness. It's important we come together in these difficult times and put a stop to the violence we're seeing. Now on to today's topic. Today we're joined by Treasurer Pichek, Secretary Moore, Ted Brady from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, and Michael Gahn from the Municipal Bond Bank to talk about a strategy that will save Vermont towns a substantial amount of money as they rebuild following this summer's flooding. Treasurer Pichek will cover the details of the program and how it will work, but we know communities started repairing infrastructure immediately after the damage this summer and now have bills to pay. And as we saw after Irene, rebuilding can take years, and sometimes the reimbursements from FEMA take some time, but the repairs are needed immediately. This program will help towns get access to capital at a much lower rate to move projects forward and save taxpayers money. My team will continue to work with our local and federal partners to fill the gaps when needed. And I want to thank Treasurer Pichek and his team for working to identify and fill this need. So with that, I'll turn it over to Treasurer Pichek. Uh, thank you very much, Governor, and uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you first, Governor, for your remarks about um, the shooting over the weekend in Burlington. Thank you for your leadership and for your administration's leadership as well on that very um, tragic uh, situation. So the program that we're here to announce uh, today is part of the Treasurer's Office expansion of the 10% in Vermont program. Uh, we announced this program earlier in the year designed to uh, focus on housing, on climate resiliency and infrastructure, uh, and on social equity. Now we announced the program prior to the flooding of July 2023, and when the flooding occurred we rethought what are the highest and best uses for this money. Uh, we did announce $55.5 million in housing investments a few months ago, uh, and now today we're announcing $15 million of low interest loans through the Municipal Bond Bank for communities that were impacted by the flooding in July. So after the flooding, a lot of the communities had to uh, go to banks, they had to go to their lenders, they had to get loans. Uh, we did work with the governor and his administration and Secretary Flynn to advance payments to towns so that they had more cash on hand uh, and had to uh, have the ability to avoid going to a bank in this high interest rate environment. But many of them had to, and they have uh, bank loans on their books for eight or nine percent. So that's going to cost their taxpayers money. That's going to delay their rebuilding efforts and their recovery efforts as they await this payment from FEMA or other sources. So this program is really designed to be a bridge for communities to get from where they are now uh, to the FEMA reimbursement that will come maybe six, a year, 18 months from now. It will also provide the opportunity for some additional planning and recovery as they look ahead to larger infrastructure projects that have to occur, and I know Secretary Moore uh, will talk about that. But being able to work through the bond bank um, and being able to structure this program in the way that we have, we're able to offer 1% loans for those loans that are less than five years and 1.5% loans for those that are less than seven years, which is the extent 
of the program. So we believe within that five to seven year period, uh, most of these communities will have their reimbursements uh, or they'll have longer term funding in place uh, to solve their infrastructure needs uh, going forward. So again, the expectation is that that will save communities over the life of the program uh, over three and a half million dollars uh, in taxpayer money. So we're uh, we're appreciative of that. We're we're excited to be able to implement this program, save taxpayer money, uh, allow municipalities to continue to recover uh, and rebuild, and really. I'm appreciative of the partnership both with the bond bank and the league and also the administration uh, to be able to bring this forward today uh, and implement it uh, successfully. So with that, I'd like to turn uh, the podium over to Secretary Julie Moore. Good morning. I wanted to take just a couple of minutes to provide a little bit of additional context for the importance of this funding. Uh, not only to continue to aid flood impacted municipalities in meeting their short term cash flow needs, but also in providing much needed breathing room that will enable planning not just to build back, but to truly build back better. I'm going to focus specifically on known needs related to Vermont's wastewater facilities, which were particularly hard hit by the summer floods. For context, Vermont has 92 wastewater facilities that together serve about half of all Vermonters. More than one-third of these facilities, 33 in total, saw some amount of damage during the floods. And three facilities in particular, in Johnson, Hardwick, and Ludlow, experienced what could rightly be considered catastrophic damage that will require either extensive rebuilding or possible relocation. And in the interim, their cost to the temporary solutions that are needed to keep these facilities operational and providing their important public health and environmental outcomes things like generators, especially going into winter. Um, and the towns don't necessarily have the capital on hand right now to rent or buy this equipment. In addition, over the last two months, ANR partnered with 10 towns to complete camera inspections of sewer pipes in areas that were inundated by floodwaters. This work identified further immediate repairs that are also needed. And unfortunately, uh, as with generators, these communities have little capital to make these repairs within their current year's budget. In total, statewide, we estimate that there's more than $75 million worth of damage incurred to wastewater facilities when you consider both treatment plants and the supporting sewer pipe networks. And while, as the governor and treasurer Pichak indicated, much of the cost of these projects will ultimately be covered by insurance and FEMA reimbursement, there is an upfront cost to this work, which can be significant. It includes things like planning, engineering design, and procuring needed supplies. Given all this, it is clear the important role the funding being announced today will play in supporting municipalities in their ongoing recovering effort. Further, this funding helps ensure communities are able to make decisions um, around recovery and reinvestment in core and infrastructure based on what will serve them best in the long term as opposed to being limited to by what they can afford in the short term. And with that, I will turn it over to Ted Brady from the League of Cities and Towns. Thanks so much, Julie. Uh, so the Vermont League of Cities and Towns uh, represents all 247 cities and towns in Vermont. We also serve as their insurer. Uh, so we've been uh, in the trenches with the state with FEMA and trying to help towns put themselves back together and make sure they have funding to do that. Within days after the July flooding, the treasurer, uh, Michael from the bond bank, the governor's office, uh, and believe it or not, the Vermont Bankers Association came together and said, we have a problem. The lending environment after this flood is a lot different than the lending environment after Irene. It's gonna cost towns millions of dollars in interest alone uh, to recover. And uh, the bankers, the treasurer, the bond bank, the administration came together and said, how do we, how do we stop that? How, how do we fix that? And they came up with a pretty selfless uh, idea. You know, bankers were willing to do some work to get money out the door immediately. The treasurer's office and the bond bank were willing to come up with some ideas to find some low cost uh, uh, loans. The administration's been working with towns to try to make sure they can put themselves back together and, and have uh, payments um, uh, accelerated. A lot of things have happened. Uh, put simply, uh, this program is going to allow towns to pay for government services and pay for things like the salaries of plow workers and uh, water workers and cops instead of paying interest to the tune of you know several million dollars. And it's going to uh, impact the, the most impacted uh, 
towns in Vermont, which is uh, here at the League. In addition to that, uh, we're going to subsidize the interest for about 35 communities, up to 35 communities that, the worst, that were the worst impacted by the flooding and that have uninsured losses uh, that they need to finance uh, while we, they wait for FEMA payments. And the League anticipates that to be about a, a million dollars. Uh, towns are trying to put themselves back together. They're, this is budget season, so it's the perfect time. You know, believe it or not, this is when they have to put that budget together that you vote on a town meeting. And this is the perfect time to say, oh, Maybe we have an alternative to uh, a high interest loan product, or really a market rate into the loan product right now, and we can look to the bond bank and look to the treasurer's office. So uh, this is a welcome uh, piece of relief during budget season, and I think uh, municipalities are gonna be able to uh, rebuild uh, faster and stronger thanks to this, without, uh, hopefully without cutting budgets, laying people off, uh, or raising taxes. Thanks so much. I think I'm supposed to turn it over to the bond bank, to Michael. Michael Gaughan from the Bond Bank. <laughs> Hi, Michael Gaughan, Executive Director of the Vermont Bond Bank. Thank you, Treasurer Pichek and Governor Scott, for allowing us to create the Municipal Climate Recovery Fund, through which we will pass along the rate of the 10% in Vermont program without alteration for Vermont's cities, towns, and villages to recover from the summer's flooding. At a time when the state is facing many overlapping and often tragic challenges, the 10% in Vermont program is a great example of leveraging existing resources to make a meaningful impact. The purpose of the MCRF is to provide budgetary relief while awaiting um, FEMA reimbursements by lowering interest rate and extending the term of the loans taken out for those purposes. Our Vermont banking community has done a great job in stepping in to fill the need, but there's no escaping the fact that rates are currently at 20-year highs and this program will provide timely savings to while also allowing banks to redeploy that capital. The pro, as Mike mentioned, the program will save taxpayers an estimated $3.5 million over the life of the program. And as Ted just described, the subsidy provided by PASSIF will allow another million, up to another million dollars, bringing the total to $4.5 million through this program. The MCRF will provide loans for seven years at an interest at a blended interest rate of 1.3%. The first two years of the loan will be interest only, as we believe this is when the majority of the FEMA reimbursements will occur. However, we structured the program with a longer term to ensure that communities have breathing room for unexpected delays or the complexities of building back smarter. This program really grew out of our experiences after Irene, when as recently as 2020, we observed communities that were still working to resolve related costs. It became apparent that in responding to climate disasters, a structured financing with a long, with a medium term and a low interest rate was ideal for sustainable and flexible recovery. The program is also an extension of our work to help municipalities with resources after the summer's flooding. We have provided legal guidance on how to borrow on a tax and basis post-disaster, as well as refinancing and restructuring existing loans to provide immediate debt service savings for flood impacted communities. We talked to dozens of communities to evaluate the need for this program over the course of the last several months. On that note, I want to thank my staff at the Bond Bank and our loan officer, Ken Lingi, for doing the hard, word, hard work of uh, understanding conditions on the ground as they exist. We will review details of the program with potential borrowers and the public through a webinar on Tuesday, December 12th at noon. Registration details as well as more information about the program are available on our website at vtbondbank.org backslash mcrf. However, uh, with this moment in the press here, we want to ask that all towns that may be interested in this program reach out to us as soon as possible so that we don't leave anyone behind and allow everyone to benefit from this great program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Uh, we'll now open it up to questions. If, if it really takes a year and a half for FEMA to send money, why is that? Well, I don't know if it's it's all the money. You know, it comes um, when projects are, are um, moved forward. Um, there has to be design and so forth, and, and then the dollars associated with that. Uh, so sometimes it, it takes a while uh, for the projects to be completed and the money to come as well. So I think, I think we've mentioned this before in the last month or so, but uh, it wasn't until this past year that we finished the last project for Irene. 
Um, so some of that money, you know, flows with the project uh, as they come forward. So you don't get paid until the project's done. You have to that, put up all the all the front money. Yeah, I, I, th not every time, uh, and that's why there's no consistent flow of money. And this gives us some consistency, uh, something that the towns can can uh, can get behind and have some security uh, to know they can complete the project and they can move forward. They can get the design working and the engineering and permitting and so forth. So, um, you know, we use Johnson uh, for an example. And it wasn't long, I was there right after uh, the damage uh, to their uh, sewer system. Uh, and, um, and they were just concerned about the ability to, to do anything because they didn't have the, the money. They didn't have the tax capacity, they didn't have anything. And they weren't sure if FEMA was going to supply that, uh, that need. Um, so, getting them up and going uh, in the in the meantime, uh, and then developing plans to move forward to mitigate future damage uh, is is going to be part of this whole package. But uh, having the money to to design and permit um, is essential. Is anybody but up here? Anything else that I missed on that? Does anybody up here know how much flood recovery related debt municipalities have incurred? Uh, we don't have a great understanding of that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we don't have a great understanding of that, but in our conversations with communities, things are changing rapidly, and only, I think, the most recently have they completed their final FEMA uh, discussions, but it was estimated to be, you know, up to $35 million. Um, but, you know, th we aren't talking to every single person and every single loan, but, but clearly there's a need. So, uh, sounds like there has been more debt incurred than is going to be available to, to refinance that debt. Um, how are you going to decide who gets what? Yeah, great question. So um, one, that number that I cited was, you know, as we were developing the program was a bit of an estimate because folks were trying to figure out what the actual costs are. Um, but to the extent we have oversubscription for the program, we'll use something we're calling a disaster impact ratio, where we will take the, um, you know, the losses, less uh, insurance payouts, plus own source revenue loss divided by their last year's budget to develop an understanding and help prioritize funding. But we're hopeful that this should um, provide uh, enough for everybody, in particular because as we refinance loans from banks, the banks will then be able to turn around and relend while staying within their um, single name limits for individual borrowers. So municipalities have lots of debt, and they refinance existing debt that's not flood related, or is it restricted? This particular over? program is just for flood related uh, short term interim loans. And then, um, when homeowners hear interest-only loans, they sometimes little red flags go up, like maybe that's not a great thing, or they're not going to be paying on the principal, but I presume it's interest-only to make it easier for the municipality to repay in the first couple of years? That's right. Um, in the first two years, is, as I mentioned, when we expect those FEMA reimbursements to occur. So rather than amortizing debt or paying down principal on um, loan amounts that will then be reimbursed by FEMA. We wanted to provide um, sufficient time to receive those reimbursements, but then after two years, starting in year three, they would begin to pay down principal uh, if it's not already paid off. And this is more of a broader question about the program, so I don't know if Commissioner Pichek wants to answer it, but when, um, when you made the initial announcement about shifting the focus of the 10% to housing, I remember that um, that shifted some of those resources away from others who had been hoping they were going to maybe benefit from that program, like um, Burlington, as I recall, was considering and hoping to get funding for its McNeil District Energy Program. So can you speak to, in any way, who's the loser here if you're going to take this $15 million and steer it toward uh, flood debt recovery? Yeah, so, you know, I, I, we still have more money in the facility, you know, within the 10% of Vermont program to do additional lending. And we do view this program as being something that is shorter term, which is attractive to us. So there's more money available. There's hopefully more money available within the next couple of years from paybacks from this program. So I think for us, it's a matter of prioritization. 
Um, we want to get to those energy projects. We want to be thinking about that. Um, but we did want to prioritize housing, flood impacted communities um, like we're announcing today and housing uh, as it relates to those that were flooded out as well. We did amend our focus a bit um, on the housing front to incorporate communities that were impacted by the flooding uh, and to set aside money specific for rebuilding uh, individuals that were impacted by the flood and, and VHFA is executing on that. So can you think of any other projects in the state that are not gonna get funded because of this shift in focus to housing and, um, and, and flood recovery or is it just too broad? So, you know, we did, when we, um, put out a request for applications. You know, we had about 85 million available, and I believe in total we had like $250 million of ask, if you looked at everyone that had asked for an, an, in the application. So clearly we won't be able to fund all of those projects at once. Some of the projects aren't great for this source of capital either. Um, we need it to be very low risk. The bond bank is uh, backing up this money. Municipalities are a good entity to lend to. And there's also the state intercept. So we sort of have three different levels of security here. So risk is a big factor for us when we prioritize, as is the impacts that we're trying to make. Um, this will certainly have an impact on, on climate resiliency uh, as well uh, going forward. So it does hit that climate uh, resiliency you know, goal that we articulated. It's just not the kind of projects at this moment that we expected to fund from the energy field. But we're working on that, and we're trying to think about ways to um, to get funding to those projects as well. And I think I understood the $3.5 million in savings, but I don't think I understood the additional million that gets us to 4.5 total. Can we just yeah. recap that? Really? Absolutely. So there are 35 communities in Vermont that had uh, losses that exceeded their insurance, where they're insured, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. So these are towns that, uh, in flood zones, uh, their insurance caps out at a certain dollar figure. They might have had a building damaged, some piece of property damaged. Uh, those 35 towns are eligible to apply for an interest subsidy down to 0%. So, so we'll, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, our passive insurance program, will uh, actually cover the difference between that 1.3% and 0% for the life of that loan. So uh, those 35 communities will be eligible for um, you know, not having to pay uh, any interest. They'll, obviously, they'll have to pay the loan back, but they won't have to pay any interest back. Ted, you, you mentioned earlier, without this money, people would either see reductions in service, cuts, or rising taxes. Can you speak a little bit more about physically, like what Vermonters would feel and see if it were not for this money? Yeah, sure. Well, I think you, you don't need to look much past the capital district to see two towns that are really struggling to make their budgets. Uh, you look at Montpelier and you look at uh, Barrie. Those are two, uh, Barrie City, two real close examples of, of cities that have to put their budgets together. They might not have sales tax revenue coming in. They've had to abate property taxes. In addition to that, they've had to invest a little money in rebuilding roads, bridges, and a uh, few million dollars worth of public uh, buildings that they've had to put money back into. Those communities, when they go to budget season, they have to look at their revenues, they have to look at what they need to spend, and uh, one of those line items in most budgets is interest, you know, debt, the cost of debt. And this is going to reduce the cost of debt so that they, uh, they can put more of that money in those other places. Um, when you go to town meeting and vote in your, your budget, uh, you'll see that, you know, the, the debt line, and this allows that line to be smaller so those budgets can account for other other aspects of running a town, so they don't need to raise taxes or cut services. Governor, you said you offer your support, the state support, to the Islamic Society of Vermont. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what you think that support ought to be. Well, again, I just want to reassure, um, it was the Dr. Ali. Uh, he's the president of the Islamic Society, and I just wanted to be sure that he knew uh, he had our support in any way needed. Uh, and that he was able to reassure uh, the followers of uh, the Islamic faith uh, that we, we stood behind them as well. And, and I, we had a great conversation. Um, he was going to do everything. I think we have the same mission. Uh, we don't want to incite violence. We want to tamp that down. And, uh, and, and him uh, making some of the statements he's made, as well as other faiths, I think has gone a long ways in doing that. What do you foresee in the, in the near future as concrete actions on your part um, that you hope will uh, advance the goals that you mentioned of 
indie violence and preventing this from, from you know, becoming a flashpoint for, um, for something you don't want to see. Yeah, well, again, it's all individual as well. Um, different groups uh, can have uh, a direct impact on this, uh, but us uh, as individuals can. The whole mode of, of trying to be more respectful, more civil, more understanding, um, I think uh, goes a long way, and that uh, that's a groundswell. Groundswell, middle out, top down. Um, we need all of those approaches in order uh, to create a more sensible uh, civilization, and uh, and I know that uh, that doesn't answer all uh, that we have, um, and there are extremists uh, that we have to deal with, and some of that will become um, become uh, the responsibility of us and our our VIC um, being able to um, promote um, um, uh, information center, um, intelligence center. To, uh, to to find uh, those flashpoints, uh, to be able to track uh, where there is going to be an ember uh, that could explode. And um, so we'll continue to do that work, step that up as much as we can. Uh, but we need everyone just to come together in this, uh, in this moment um, to be better human beings. Based on the evidence you've seen, the briefings that you've got, do you think that this is an alleged crime that I think, uh, you know, that I'll leave that uh, to the courts and the prosecutor, defense, and so forth. But I think, um, I think the state's attorney, uh, Sarah George, has said it right. Uh, whether it's a hate crime or not, it was a hateful act, and uh, I think that that was um, that was the right, the right thought. Uh, there's a high bar for a hate crime, and um, I know uh, the the president. Uh, the White House, uh, Homeland Security, have all, uh, and, the, and the U.S. attorneys as well, have all said that they will be there to help if uh, if need be. Um, but that's for them to determine. Have you thought about uh, inquiring to Sarah George's office whether a psych eval has been ordered? Should be should be ordered? Any thoughts about that? Um, I think that's a strategy. Um, both the defense and the prosecutor will probably work out amongst themselves. Um, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised. But but that's something that is in their court. Have you had any conversations with your commissioner of public safety about um, the viability or merits of some sort of action on law enforcement's part to? Um, I don't know, enhanced surveillance of, of... Yeah, we have, um, and we have um, since some of the violence began uh, a month or so ago, um, and reached out uh, to all the organizations involved uh, to make sure that the, if they needed help, they wanted more assistance, they wanted more of a presence, uh, that we were there for them. So I know um, I don't know if it was the commissioner, um, but uh, but law enforcement, BSP, um, the colonel, and so forth, uh, they've reached out individually to them to offer assistance if needed. And has that resulted in any increased patrols or activity by state police that we wouldn't see otherwise? That I don't. I, I, I'm sure that it has. But uh, I don't know, Dan, do you have anything you can offer uh, to this? I mean, we can get back to you on this as well, but. Uh, Dan Bates, I'm the Deputy Commissioner of Public Safety. Uh, I'll echo what the Governor said. We've uh, given assistance to the investigation. Our crime scene team was there. The Vermont State Police crime scene investigation team was there. Our, our warden service um, uh, uh, offered resources to the investigation as well. Uh, our uh, intelligence center has uh, 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 stepped up is the wrong word, but um, increased sensitivity, looking for trends. We have not found any uh, any meaningful warning signs that would indicate uh, anything more. Uh, and just offered the assistance to local uh, law enforcement of anything that we can do. Uh, we do regularly assist Burlington on patrols. Um, we've not had any requests that I know of. Uh, I'll, I, I would want to double check that before I said for sure. Uh, we've not had any requests that I know of to increase patrols in that area, but uh, we can certainly find out and get back to it. The governor, specifically with some of the protests surrounding just the conflict in general and then after this shooting happened, are you concerned that um, 
about the possibility of violence breaking out of these protests? And is the state planning to preemptively monitor them more so after this happens? Yeah, well, I, I would say that uh, we're on a heightened uh, level of, um, of response at this point in time. Uh, so when we see those events, uh, obviously we pay attention. So our, our law enforcement community is working together uh, across uh, municipalities and state level and, and federal level uh, to coordinate uh, any efforts we see. How do you balance that kind of um, law enforcement prevention and protection with upholding people's First Amendment rights too. Yeah, I mean, First Amendment comes first, right? And so we just want to make sure that we they're doing so safely and that we're not impacting uh, any, especially uh, those who who um, are innocent bystanders. Um, so we want to make sure that we're doing all we can to protect the general public. Um, incarcerated individuals Kentucky died on Sunday. Um, I wonder if Commissioner Demo or Secretary Samuels. Maybe uh, I don't know if either one of them are on. Secretary Samuels. Secretary Samuelson, did you hear the question about the death of the inmate in Kentucky? I heard a statement, but I didn't hear a specific question. I'm well, hoping you could just tell us everything you know about what happened at this stage, Secretary. So I, I think I would direct the folks back to the press release, um, but essentially we had an incarcerated individual who was 17, uh, who was 72 years old, incarcerated at a state in Kentucky. Um, he was having a medical uh, situation. Uh, the staff there responded and he was transported um, to the hospital. Um, but unfortunately, even with life-saving um, mechanisms, he, would, he was pronounced dead shortly um, thereafter. He was serving a 30-year life sentence for kidnapping and murder and second degree and sexual assault um, and had been in Kentucky uh, for um, some time as his preference was to, to be out of state. Any indication on cause of death at this point? Um, they have initiated uh, an investigation into the cause of death, but at this point there is nothing um, that arises that looks suspicious in any way. And what role will your agency play in, in reviewing the circumstances that, that led to this death? Yeah, the um, Department of Corrections is working um, closely with officials in Kentucky um, and through the interstate compact, um, and it is, is reviewing the policies, procedures, um, and the circumstances um, of, uh, of this death, Mr. Schaefer's death. Thank you. I thought all the inmates were in Mississippi. Uh, yeah, sorry, Mississippi. I think we dated ourselves. It was Kentucky what, was before, years? yeah. Okay. <laughs> Governor, uh, the defense for a, a, a Burlington teen who's being charged as an adult in sec for second, alleged second degree murder, the defense is trying to move that into family court. Uh, meanwhile, the victim's family, they're starting a petition and they're ramping up calls for uh, the state to continue to build a facility that would house young offenders charged with big 12 crimes. Where do we stand with that, that conversation? Yeah, we share uh, in determining a location for a stepped up facility of some sort in the future, but that's not something that's going to happen overnight. Um, so um, we will continue uh, to move forward. Uh, we have a number of, of um, ideas in place, um, but, um, but we need a site to cool. do to do that. It's a long-term project. What's being done in the short term? Um, we are, are, we have a, a, a facility that we're revamping in Middlesex at this point in time. Uh, there's also the sheriff in, in uh, Wyndham County uh, has a room for um, a short-term um, capacity. Uh, and then we have out-of-state resources. Commissioner Winters said that it might be online the Middlesex facility by December or, or January? Are, are we still on, on track? For that? I believe so, yes. 
And, and do you have separate ones for trouble versus dangerous? Yeah. Yeah, that, that there is a difference. Um, and so, some of the, the more dangerous would not go to a facility like Middlesex. Where would they go still? Would out of state. Uh, uh, depends on the situation. Can we go back to the um, inmate death for a second? Does this and some other recent-ish inmate deaths make the state rethink perhaps its medical release programs for inmates, folks who may no longer be a danger to society, say, from 72? Um, well, again, I don't know. I mean, if you talk to the victims of, uh, of that crime, aggravated assault and, and murder, um, they might say that that doesn't end. Um, so from my perspective, what we're seeing a lot of is our aging demographics. I mean, it's, we're seeing it as a society here in Vermont. Uh, we're aging out. Uh, that we've shifted, we've, we have an 80% increase of uh, those over 65 in the last 20 years. Um, so that um, that tells a lot about what's happening in Vermont, but also our, our um, inmates, our correctional facilities are seeing the same thing. We're, we're getting older. So um, we're going to see more natural deaths uh, in those facilities as well. And um, but, but as far as um, releasing them, uh, I'm not sure that that's, I'm not sure that's the right approach in every situation, just because of age. I guess it's a philosophical debate then in terms of what is the purpose of incarcerating people? Is it to remove them from society if they're a danger, or is it making them pay for? I'd say, I'd say yes to both. To both. <coughs> so go back a couple of weeks ago when you talked about the housing crisis. You said you were gathering all the principal players together to try to come up with and move forward with something that that works for everybody. Is do you have an update on that? I'm I don't sure. have any update at this point in time. Um, there was a rock slide on Interstate 91. Um, Vermont has seemed to be scraping all the potential sites for slides. Is this one that was missed or scraped and didn't work? Um, I'm not sure. Maybe Secretary Flynn can answer this, but uh, but we have over the last few decades have seen a lot of slides in, in Vermont uh, in some of these locations. It depends on what type of rock is there and um, the, the angles of uh, uh, of the veins in the in the material itself. So, Secretary Flynn, anything on this one? Thank you. Um, that was a fairly major rock slide. We have the interstate down to one lane in that area. It's not a matter of missing something. What we do is we take a look at where there have been problems and we take a look at places where we predict there will be problems. But when you look at the miles of interstate and the miles of ledge we have in this state, it's impractical or impossible to get all of it at one time. I think a lot of what you're seeing is not only aging infrastructure in the ground, but when you look at in some cases 60 years of rain, freeze, thaw. That's one of the major contributors uh, potentially to why you're seeing some of these slides, just the way the formations are. Okay. Okay. Thank you. We've got a few folks online and then we'll come back to the room. Uh, we'll start with Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. I was wondering if uh, Michael Pichek can talk about what the, the cash on hand balance for the state is right now and um, why not make more money available through this program if there is money available. Yeah, thanks, Tim, for the question. So, you know, as of this morning, our state's cash on hand balance was about two billion and eighty-nine million. So, just about that two billion dollar mark of unrestricted cash balance. Um, it's sort of hovered at that mark, right around two billion for the last eighteen months or so. So that's been pretty consistent. You know, in that in that two billion is a significant amount of federal money that needs to be spent down in the next couple of years. Uh, we also know there is more state revenue that's making up that two billion as time goes on. So we really wanted to take a conservative approach to expanding this program from about thirty million to hundred million. Um, that brings us to about five percent of the state's cash deposit. Uh, we'll meet again as a as an office as a committee in early January and decide whether we're comfortable increasing that again or not. 
But that's really the balance there, Tim, is not knowing if that if that full two billion dollars is going to sort of be around for the next five, ten years, and we're making these loans generally on longer term uh, timelines. So it's something we're considering, but we thought this was a big first step. We wanted to evaluate and see how it went, and uh, we'll continue to evalu evaluate that cash balance. Now, some of the questions today have been on um, cost shifting some of that money that was available. It, will that factor in at all when you when you reevaluate in January whether some of these other programs need money that that maybe didn't get it because of the the flooding and the the subsequent impact of that? Uh, Tim, I'm going to ask uh, Mike uh, to comment uh, as well on where we were before we received all the federal money and where we are today because I think it's important for Vermonters to know this isn't excess money. We just have. Um, up in the cupboard. I mean, this is money that's committed. Uh, we have to spend it somewhere. We've already done that. It's just going to take some time before we can put it uh, in the ground or, or in the air or whatever we're doing with it from an infrastructure standpoint. Um, so um, it's committed money. Um, so we have to determine when that is, when it's going to be needed uh, for the purpose that is sitting there waiting for. And then that's up to the treasurer to decide when that cycle is. So I just don't want everyone to get the wrong impression here. We don't have an excess of $2 billion uh, waiting there for other purposes. Um, we are fairly restricted on that money. We, we need to put it, we have the match money as well uh, for these infrastructure projects and so forth uh, that's going to be needed. But what we had before we received all this federal money, it's just a fraction of what we're seeing for balance today. And that wasn't too long ago, but I'm sure Treasurer can. Is there any risk of clawback by the federal There is always risk of clawback. But once they've committed and once we have it in, in place, I, I'm not sure that they can claw that back. But if we don't commit it, uh, then there's a risk of uh, clawback. And just that, you know, to echo the governor's point, he's exactly right. Like just be, you know, a few years before the pandemic, our cash balance was you know, 300 million, 200 million in that ballpark. And this money is money that's either already been appropriated or we've collected it and it's being weighted to be appropriated in the upcoming budget cycle. So um, the other thing to remember, Tim, is that we are earning interest on this money, whether through our banks or through treasuries. And uh, generally, we're getting pretty good interest rate, like five and a half percent um, in our highest bank. So in a previous year where the interest that we earned as a state was less than a million dollars, you know, this year it will be tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars. So that's another benefit. I mean, it's not that it's just sitting there, you know, for no productive purpose. That's money that then can be appropriated in the upcoming budget cycle. So we're appropriate and we're strategic where we can sort of use this program and we think it's a better use of money to, to incentivize the development of something like housing or buy down interest rates to save taxpayer money. We'll definitely try to find those opportunities. But, you know, as the governor said, this money is accounted for, uh, so we want to be conservative with it. Okay, well, thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Thanks, Jason. No questions today. Thank you. Chris Boy, Newport Daily Express. All right, we'll go back to the room. Governor, later today, um, there's going to be a coalition of environmental organizations that are going to be highlighting uh, upcoming changes to the renewable energy standard um, from, and I understand the, admi the administration's been involved with this work as well during this working group. What, what does that work look like from, from your perspective? Well, thankfully I have the expert here in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Secretary Moore, is anything you can offer? I don't know here? if Commissioner Tierney is on the line. We, we, can, we can actually have both of you uh, <laughs> on. Commissioner Tierney, anything you want to add uh, to this or, or even begin? G Governor, um, I think there are two observations I can make. One, um, there were two exercises performed this summer uh, looking at the renewable energy standard. One of them was the one that has been alluded to in this question, and the other is the work that the Department of Public Service undertook on its uh, own um, initiative, and we've released that report. It is on the website of the Department of Public Service. 
and it's worth having a look because there is a lot of very good data showing what Vermonters uh, would like to see in their renewable energy portfolio and their consumption of energy and the like. The work that the legislature has been doing has been driven by the legislature. Uh, I believe the committee chair is Senator Bray. Uh, the Department of Public Service has provided some support for that work um, as required, principally administrative. And to my knowledge, um, the work has come in on time, but in terms of characterizing the report, I really think it is best to defer to Senator Bray and his colleagues on the committee. I don't know if Secretary Moore would add anything to that. No, I, I think that was a good summary. Uh, question back on the demographic crisis, so to speak. Uh, VSAC still uh, sends scholarship money with students to out-of-state colleges, as I understand it. One of the few states that do that, I think with the second highest cost per pupil to educate people, and then we subsidize sending them out of state. According to the Department of Education, 50% of the graduates of college stay in the area in which they went to school. So aren't we, if all that is true, isn't that something you might, that might be changed? Yeah, well, obviously we're hoping uh, that we can get those students back uh, to come home at some point. We, we find that time and time again. Uh, they might be away for a while, but eventually they come back. And that's what we're hoping for here. Um, they grew up here in Vermont, they lived here in Vermont, um, and went to school here in Vermont. Um, we just thought it was appropriate that we help them get the education that they, they deserve and want. And um, again, we can certainly, we will be attempting to get them to return. Um, but um, I'm, I understand your point, but at the same Department, time, we have a responsibility. Department of Education, 65% of the kids who go to an in-state school stay in-state. Yeah, I'm not sure that there's a direct correlation there, but there could be. I think some of these students, if you, if you didn't offer them uh, assistance with tuition, would leave anyhow uh, and go to school somewhere yes. else. Um, so I'm not sure that that necessarily means that we'll have more kids in Vermont. But it's the same goal. Um, we need to attract more people into the state. It has to be affordable, and uh, we have to to make sure that we're doing everything we can uh, to create the housing and, and all the other infrastructure we need to get them here. Yes, but it is a bit frustrating all the money we spend on K or pre-K through, through 12, and then they take that education and help out in other communities. And, but at the same time, we, uh, we have a number of um, colleges and universities that uh, UVM is a prime example where we have a lot of out-of-state students that come and they stay. Yeah, so right. Others that's all good. Yes. Okay. Governor, when I was traveling for Thanksgiving, I drove past uh, what I think is more than a dozen housing units, mobile homes sitting on the side of the highway, uh, still not in a staging area, still not moving any closer, as far as I can tell, to being installed where people who need them and live in them in Montpelier. What's your understanding of the status and are you frustrated at the case? Yeah, I mean, it has uh, taken longer than we had hoped, uh, but, uh, but I know that they've signed the agreement. Dan might be able to talk about this uh, more. Um, but, um, but they have signed the agreement. Uh, they're going to move forward. Uh, FEMA uh, believes that they will start construction uh, within the next two weeks. And uh, their time frame is, I think, six to eight weeks at that point. Um, so, so they're going to build that, that uh, facility in yes, the winter? Yep. You're someone who's moved dirt around in the winter in Vermont. That's not the time you really want to be constructing anything. Well, it's, it's, it can be done. It just is usually a little bit slower and a little more and quite a bit more expensive. But they're footing the tab for this. And so I, I'm sure they've worked in cold climate before. Uh, they have. Um, they have contractors that do this type of thing all over the country, and so that they're well aware of the situation they're getting themselves in, as I've been told, because I asked the same question. Okay, okay. Um, and last question for me is, um, I spoke to the General Services Agency the other day about the federal building downtown, and they cannot even assure, I think, the state or the city that they're going to be able to reopen that building. There are so many problems from the flood 
but for other heating systems, they call it electrical systems. That, um, so, for, so Montpelier residents wondering when their post office going back in the federal building are being told we're not sure it is. Um, what's your? That's a prominent building in downtown. Yeah, and, it's, and, it uh, certainly is, and I think uh, I think Montpelier needs a post office in their downtown. Uh, we have reached out uh, to them, the GSA, and offered any state uh, resources we can. And there are some buildings that we think could work for them, um, but uh, at this point in time, they haven't been interested, or the post office hasn't been interested in what we've had to offer, but we'll continue to make those offers. So as it stands now, do you know if they've got a site and a plan to move forward I, to open a temporary space? I have not heard it, probably any more than you have. What, what has the state offered for facilities? Um, we have some buildings uh, in Montpelier that might help um, facilitate a post office, and we've offered to to show them some of those and see if there's something we can do to work together on that. But uh, again, there hasn't been any interest in going any further than that. Have they at least looked at them with you? They haven't even taken a tour of existing buildings in Montpelier with the state to see no. if those are agreeable to them? No, we've, we've done so just by communication, and the response was um, they have no interest at this point. The federal delegation has blasted the leadership of the, of the Postal Service for, being, for its lack of communication with the state and with the local governments. Do you, do you agree with that criticism? Well, I, yeah, I would think that they would be doing everything they can to find a yeah. temporary sol a solution, uh, which I think we could offer, um, or even a more permanent solution, which we might be able to offer as well. Thank you. What about the other occupants of that building? Are there USDA folks? There, there? there are many. Uh, FHWA, I think, is in there, Federal Highway, um, and... Uh, and others, but yeah, I, they've been displaced as well. I don't know where they are, to be honest with you, but uh, but they've been displaced. Okay. And when you like, is the state working directly with the postal service or with GSA? Our, our reach out was just to the GSA, okay. and it was just it wasn't something they requested. I just said uh, to our secretary of administration, why don't we reach out to them and see if there's any interest um, because. We know the need, um, and I think we can get creative and find a solution. But uh, they had some back and forth conversations, and in the end, they went to uh, GSA, went to the post office, who makes the uh, ultimate decision, and they said they had no interest in in moving. Did the state offer forward. space for the other folks in that building too, or just the? Have not. I mean, okay. it was just the post office we were talking about at that point, changes. right? Governor, the ultimate softball question. Good. You, we'll see. <laughs> uh, poll this morning, you have an 84% approval rating, first in the nation among governors. And I guess my, my real question is, none of us in this room have ever been the most popular governor in the nation. And I wonder, what does that feel like? What is, I mean, to you, what does that feel like? Yeah, I keep saying this, but it's, it's like just a snapshot in time, a small number of people being polled and and they come up with this and you know it can go the other way just as quickly as it went up so i don't i don't take too much stock in it thanks can we go back to the um low interest loan program for, i think this is a question for you michael or maybe um Peter P. Check. one of the um, michaels <laughs> yeah true um more michaels than women in the world. um but uh, can you give us an idea of what the interest rates would be for municipalities if not for this program, like as a point of comparison? Yeah, great question. Um, that came up in our calculation, our estimate of the savings for this program. So, you know, we've been dealing with the floods since uh, the summer, obviously. And if you have followed the markets, um, they're quite volatile at the moment. But we estimate um, that rate, um, and it depends. You know, some have found our guidance or otherwise found guidance on how to do their short-term borrowing on a tax-exempt basis, which will lower the rate. But for others, in the interest of um, speed, they have not necessarily chosen that path. And so the rate varies from probably about 5%, and we've heard uh, even up to se a little over 7%. Um, yeah, so you know, very, very significant um, in, in this environment. So it's this is a this is a tremendous win for um, Vermont's municipalities. 
this might be a dumb question, but how is the bond bank able to afford to offer such low interest loans? Like if that comes at a cost to you guys. Uh, yeah, so um, the bond bank, uh, it's tough not to start at our creation. We're the first bond bank in the country um, about 50 years ago. It's a, we call ourselves the best kept secret in the state. But, um, you know, in all of our loan programs, we don't take a spread. Uh, so, and that differentiates us from some other um, statewide instrumentalities. And we're able to do that because of um, some programmatic revenue we have and from some reserves that we have that help our credit rating, but also we can sort of live off the interest on. So we're small and nimble. We have three staff. Um, and so with our pooled loan program, uh, which is our bigger program, it's about $600 million in loans, we pass along the rate that we get uh, when we go to the capital markets directly to our borrowers, basically without adjustment. We'll do the same thing here for the 10% of Vermont program. So the rate that the treasurer's office and the state will give the bond bank, we will then pass along to our borrowers because our sort of overhead is covered through other sources. And the credit risk is low, I should also mention. You know, these are, these are the, for the most part, these are going to be tax-backed loans from Vermont's municipalities. And clearly, the bond bank believes in the future of all the municipalities in the state. Is the state going to offer really small towns that may not have staff numbers? Is the state going to offer any sort of resources for folks to be able to navigate this and apply and all of that? We, we have offered um, resources in terms of some of those small communities that don't have anyone to, to move forward with any of their projects. So uh, we have uh, offered that and we put $3 million aside for that. Um, and but, but in this particular case, with this project, I'm not sure it's going to take a lot. Um, it, it seems as though you know, calling one of the mics uh, might get that done. <laughs> I really don't think it's a complicated process. No, we're going to make the application as simple as possible. Um, and actually, you know, in particular, the Ad well, I should say, again, the Addison County communities, um, those are the ones that are, I think that um, we're not used to necessarily doing short-term borrowing. And we don't have a pre-existing relationship with, in some cases, communities like Ripton. And so uh, in this form, we'd ask that they reach out to us. We will walk them through the process and make it as simple as possible. Thank you all very much. Thank you,